Um, I'm very blessed to have the friends I do and the family that I have, and uh, pretty, pretty lucky that way. But growing up, it wasn't that way. And when I was experiencing growing up in a small town in Montana, uh, I felt picked on, I felt bullied, I, I, I felt despised by everyone around me. And as a kid, that's very t debilitating. That makes it very difficult to want to do anything, to do, want to do well in school, to want to do well at home, to care for people, to love people, to be kind to people. Um, and so it's no wonder that the mindset that I had uh, sunk into a, a depression that uh, I couldn't get myself out of. See, what ended up happening was I, I, I used to blame my classmates a lot for, for this. I used to blame the kids in my school for this. Um, and yes, there's an aspect of that where you know kids are not always nice to each other. They're not always the most considerate or compassionate. Uh, but what ended up, as I got older, what it, what it started to see was that it wasn't, it wasn't that they were trying to hurt me, necessarily. It wasn't that they were trying to make me feel the way I felt. Uh, they, even, they themselves were insecure. They themselves were trying to figure out life and high school and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough road. But as I kind of read through this passage and, and as we looked at the mockers in the last day, this term mocker just kind of like sprung out to me and I was like, oh, I'm very familiar with mockers. You know, I'm very, I'm very familiar with people making fun of me or pointing out my... Uh, my uh, shortcomings and poking fun at that. Uh, so I, I get what you're saying here, Peter. I get, I get that. Um, and it's not the same, and we're going <laughs> to get into that. But that was my first initial thought, and, and that's kind of what helped me to relate to this a little bit more. But um, the thing is, is I got to the point where I didn't feel loved by anyone, not just my, not just my, my classmates, not by my peers or my teachers, I got to the point where I didn't even feel loved by my family, even though they, they gave me no reason to ever feel that way. They loved and supported me through everything, and it broke my mom's heart to see the way that I was feeling, and she would have done anything to take it away. So these feelings that I had, they came from somewhere else. They, didn't, they weren't necessarily true. There might have been an element of truth in it. I might have interpreted things and, and ran with them. I might have exaggerated them in my mind and in my depressed state. But this, this mocking, it, it, came, it came from a place of deception. I had, I had convinced myself of something that was untrue because of what was going on in life. And that was the first kind of thought that I had here was that mockers can twist truth into lies. They can take something that is inherently true and convince you that it's not. And so as we'll see in the passage, uh, there are mockers that Peter warns about. They're going to that try to convince believers that the Lord is not true, that his word is not to be believed, that his coming is not actually happening that we're just fools waiting for someone who will never come. But the thing is, is that comes from a place of lies. That comes from a place of insecurity. And if you guys will turn with me to the passage in, in 2 Peter 3, 1 through 9, we're going to go ahead and read the, the, the passage together. It should be up on the screen as well. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. 
But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If I were to ask you guys how many of you have experienced um, this, uh, have, have experienced being mocked before, uh, probably all of your hands would go up for one reason or another to varying degrees of severity. But all of us can relate to that. All of us can, can, can relate to, be try, to someone trying to make us feel like a fool for what we believe in, for what we follow, for what we stand by. No, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't follow that way. No, you shouldn't go that direction. No, you shouldn't go to that school. No, you shouldn't actually do your homework. That's stupid to be smart. No, you, no. Always mocking the things that you hold true, that you hold valuable. But again, have you noticed how mocking often comes from a place of insecurity? It comes from a place that they themselves can't relate to? Someone sees something that you have, and since they can't have it either, they will try to get you to abandon it? That was, that was the group of people that I loosely called friends in high school. The, the people who loosely allowed me to hang around with them at lunchtime. This was, a, this was a crowd that didn't value education. It was a crowd that didn't value uh, people. It was, it, was, it was a selfish crowd that only sought its own kind of justification. But at the same time, looking back on that, those kids felt the same way I did, looking for something to hold on to, some sort of, some sort of semblance of, uh, of hope, some sort of community, some sort of people that would care for them. And it was the best that they could hope for at the time. And their mocking of the things that others had came from a place of insecurity where they themselves felt weak. In other words, mocking has little foundation. It tempts us to believe a lie. Now, I don't want to confuse uh, I don't want to confuse doubts and good questions and fact-checking with mocking. If you have, a, if you have a, a trusted friend, a brother, a mentor, a pastor, a whomever, and, you, and, and they're questioning the choices you're making, that's not mocking. They, you know, there is a difference, and we want to act with discernment in those situations. Don't confuse it. If there are doubts... Feel them out. Study them. Ask good questions. Don't jump to the conclusion that someone is tr just trying to. But be aware that it's possible. And that's where Peter's warning comes from. Ultimately, as we have already said these past several weeks, as what I said last week, what Eli shared the week before, uh, no matter what you're being told, no matter what someone is telling you, check it against what's true. Check it against, in this case, in the, in the case of mocking Christianity, in the case of mocking our faith in, in Christ, in, in, the, in the case of being, having good questions asked of you that you don't know how to answer, if you're not sure if it's mocking or just general good wisdom, check it back to God. Check and see what God has already said about himself. That's the point. That's what, that's what we've been getting at here in, in, in 2 Peter has been if someone shares something with you, if they tell you this is to be true, check it. Look and see what God has said. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this passage. We're going to look at what Peter has to, to, to say for us here. Uh, so in verses 1 and 2, uh, let's read it again. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So Peter says right here, the purpose of the letter is so that you will have your mind stirred up sincerely, 
that you will remember the things that the Holy Prophets said, that the things that the Apostles said about Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of this letter, to remind you of what's true. It is to warn believers and to equip them to, uh, to equip them with truth to compare against untruth, to take what God has said and what has stood for thousands of years and compare it back to the new thing, compare it back to the mockers, compare it back to the, the friend who means well or who doesn't mean well. Take what God says is to be true and compare it back to what they have to say. And like I said last week, if it, if it doesn't match up, then they fail. Verse 3 says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. In the text, Peter tells us that the strategy in the last days will fall to mocking. And this is, this is critical. Think about this. If we had Peter warning us about false teachers, about educated individuals who knew their stuff, who would, who would preach and would teach and would do very well at persuading us of something that is false. But in the end, when they don't have a leg to stand on, what do they resort to? They resort to mocking. They resort to something that can't withstand any fact-checking. They, they fall back on these high school antics of trying to belittle something you believe in order to convince you of something that is false. Friends, we're, we know the truth. The truth is being presented before us. It says so in the word. God has shared it with us. When this happens, and you guys have seen this in debates and arguments and anything, you know the argument is invalid as soon as soon as someone resorts to mocking as soon as someone resorts to using uh personal attacks or starts using you know uh, uh evi- or comments without without foundation they've they've moved away from logic and reason and they've moved to just senseless mockery that just to just to prove a point just to just to convince just to win or just to make themselves feel better because they actually don't know. Verse 4 gives us one specific mocking that Peter warns about. It says, and they will say, uh, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Now, I want us to think about this for a second because this was written down in the first century, okay? That was 2,000 years ago. That was 2,000 years ago and they were being mocked that where is your savior, where is he, why hasn't he come? Okay, this is already, like, this is just years after Jesus, his death and resurrection, and they're mocking him, or they're mocking the apostles, they're mocking the church, saying, where is he? Things have just gone on continuously, nothing's changed. You've wasted generations trusting in this God, and nothing's changed. They're tempting them to say, well, maybe Jesus isn't coming back. Maybe he wasn't who he says he was. What if I'm misled? What if I'm deceived? But what does Peter say to do? He says to check it back to what God has already said to be true. We already know that God has said that Jesus is the Messiah. We already know this. We have seen countless things Uh, that were said about Jesus come true. He says in 5 through 7, he says they missed something important. 5 through 7, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. It was never our timing. It was always God's plan. Creation was God's plan. We had no say in the matter. How could we? We didn't exist. God saw fit to create. God saw fit to give life. His plan, always. He alone creates and maintains. He alone gets to judge what time is right. And we as humans, 
We are subject to time, unlike God. Verses 8 and 9. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is not bound by time. Some will use this passage to say, okay, that means like one day here is like a thousand to God. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, you know, one equals two kind of scenario. Okay, this is, this is, this is what it is. This, is. this is the relativeness of time for God. But it's not. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean, it doesn't give us a calculation that X equals one or X equals five. You know, this isn't a calculation. <coughs> this is a matter of, explaining to us in a poetic way that time to God is not the same to us. What does God care about time? He's outside of it. He sees the beginning and the end simultaneously. He knows, he knows what's going to happen. He, is know what, he knows what has already happened. He sees it all at once. It's part of his character. So God is different from us. This is what these mockers in this instance are missing. If God is subject to the same rules as human beings, then yes, maybe they have a reason to, be, to say what they say. They might be correct if God is subject to the same time constraints as human beings. But if he's not, if he's different than us, if he is the orchestrator and designer of time and creation, matter, all those types of physics-related uh, topics. If he's different than that and outside of that, then he's not bound by it, except where he sees to work inside of it, like in the case of Christ. So what do you do with this? <laughs> what, what do you do? What does it mean to you that God is outside of, of time even? How does something that we literally cannot imagine we can't fathom what it's like to not be bound by time. How are you supposed to relate to this? For one, it's just awesome, right? <laughs> it kind of makes my head hurt to think about it, but wow, how awesome is God to not be constrained by the same kind of natural order that you and I are? That being, being unconstrained by time, by natural processes, <laughs> That is a powerful being. So that's just one. It's just awesome for us to, to keep in mind. Uh, but more seriously, it, it means that, again, he's different than any other being that has ever existed. His word formed our world. His word formed us. It formed you. His word is trustworthy. And we know this in part, like we, there's a lot of reasons. We, there's a lot of reasons why we can trust this book right here and what it has to say. There's a reason. We could, we could go into a lot of uh, you know, historical evidences for why the Bible is trustworthy, why it has withstood the test of time, why we can. But let me give you just one. Uh, in an article uh, by D. James Kennedy, I have this in an in a apologetic study Bible I have at home, um, he writes this article at the very beginning. He talks about it being a conversation with, uh, with, a, with a friend, an educated individual. And he, they have this disagreement because he's a Christian, he's not. And he decides that I give him this, this, this little bit of a, a quiz. He's like, you know what, I'm going to read to you some statements. I'm going to read to you some statements, and at the end of it, they all, def they all describe a certain person in history. You know, you can probably already see where this is going. But... They describe a certain person in history, and I want you, just based off of these, to tell me who it is. So he goes off. He reads 24 verses from the Old Testament, all of which prophesying the coming of Jesus. Not just the coming of Christ, but his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, the things he would teach, the things he would say, the things that would happen to him, his crucifixion. All these things. Now, 20, you know, 21st century hindsight, we'd be like, well, yeah, of course, he means Jesus. 
But these 24 verses came from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, scholars don't argue, completed many centuries before Jesus was born. Again, this isn't, this isn't the 21st century. This isn't, they don't have access to a worldwide web that can go back and find all the things that were said and just like correlate them together and be like, hey, let's grab all these things and orchestrate them into an individual. Oh, hundreds of years hundreds of years before and if we even wanted to contest this idea being like well no maybe <clears throat> it's well known and documented that the old testament was translated into from hebrew into greek 150 years before jesus was born this isn't this isn't christian literature this isn't this isn't fan fiction this isn't just something that we made up to make ourselves feel better about what we believe in or to give validity this is historical outside of the church context these prophecies undoubtedly pointed to jesus as being the prophesied messiah the one that particularly gets me is when uh when the prophet uh, i can't remember exactly what the reference is but prophesies the crucifixion says that his hands and feet will be pierced he would be nailed to a tree when that was written, crucifixion wasn't a thing. When it was written, Rome didn't exist. And yet, hundreds of years later, Jesus meets his fate on the most, most humiliating and brutal form of execution that has ever been imagined by man. No scholar has ever been able to refute that. It is a well known and documented fact prophecies in scripture that point to christ dozens of them have been fulfilled hundreds i don't know the exact number but how is that possible how is that possible if there if 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 christ isn't who he says he is if god what he said he was going to do through jesus in redeeming mankind wasn't actually going to happen these other prophecies that foretold of this and the purpose for his death and his resurrection if that wasn't true then we are to be pitied we are fools but the word has been trustworthy it has withstood test of time it withstands speculation and scholarly uh scholarly uh inputs and tearing it apart and debating it his life ministry death and re resurrection are all foretold and it is impossible by sheer number of them to have all come true in a single person. It can't be forged. It can't be faked. Either Christ is who he says he is, or everything we know about evaluating information is wrong. So this means for us that the God that we trust in, the Savior that we wait on, is trustworthy. His word foretold him. It also tells us to believe in him. The word says that we are sinners separated from God. That we are the enemies of God. That we stand apart from God. That there is a chasm between us that we cannot bridge and that no amount of trying to earn God's favor is going to get us back there. I can't be over here separated from God and try to convince him with gifts of my goodness to say, hey God, look at me, I'm doing better. Well, better isn't good enough. But because of who Jesus was and what he did, we can be reconciled to a holy and righteous God. We are reconciled to him through faith alone, by grace alone, because of Christ alone. We sang that song in Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. <laughs> if if mockers come to me 
and tempt me to disbelieve something that I hold dear, that I believe in, that I, I believe to be truth. I take it back to what God has already said. And God has already said that his son is where hope is found. So I have hope, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to read it for yourself. And this kind of gives us our, our, our idea here that Peter says that God is patient. He says here that God is patient. He, he's giving humanity time. Time to know him. Time to be reconciled to him. There are a lot of people in the world who do not believe in Christ, who do not believe that he alone can save. They're caught up in their, their own mechanisms, their own means of proving themselves. And those people tend to have the loudest voices in trying to convince you that what you believe is false. Their hope it has no foundation. It sounds good. Yeah, the rest of the world works this way. So obviously, that, that's, that's how God works too. If I, if I, if I go to work, I, I put in the hours and I get a paycheck. Yeah, that makes sense. If, so, so therefore, if I, if I go to work for God, if I do good things and, and I put in the time and the effort, then yeah, he'll be okay with me. That makes sense. So literally every single philosophy, world religion, believes in save one. Christianity is the only one that says, you're not good enough and you never will be, but it doesn't matter because Christ still died for you. He paid the price for you. So when the mockers come and they tempt you to, to, to doubt and say, look, nothing has changed. Look, you gave your, 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 your life to Christ. You invited him into your heart. You did whatever Christian cliche you can come up with. You said some prayer. You got baptized. You did something or other. But look, nothing's actually changed. So renounce him. Your life is the same. You still get hurt. People still let you down. You still wreck your car. You still lose your job. You still fail the test. You still fall short. So renounce him because obviously it's not working. When those mockers come, we remind them what God's word has already said. First of all, we can look at them and say, you're right. I'm no better but it doesn't depend upon me. My salvation is solely in Christ alone. If it were left up to me, I'd have perished long ago. It brings me full circle to, 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 my, to, to my testimony at the beginning. I was weeks away from ending it all. I was thinking of the best way I could pull it off, thinking of what I might leave behind. If left to my own devices, if left, if left in my devastation apart from Christ, I would not be here today. It would have ended 11 years ago. But thankfully, thankfully there is a God who chases us. He chases us all the way to his death. He pursues us, he pursues us more passionately than any person could pursue anyone else, than any husband has ever pursued his wife, than any wife has ever pursued her husband. Christ pursues his church more passionately and more effectively than anyone else. And if that wasn't the case, then I wouldn't be here today. So 
So no, I, I'm, I'm familiar with mockers. I'm familiar with the people who, who tell me that I'm not good enough, who tell me that uh, I never will be. That why continue on in this because nothing's changed. To them who lack hope, who lack knowledge of the, of the cross and what it means, that's foolishness. But as Paul says, to those of us who are saved, it is the power of Christ. It is the ability that I have to stand before you on any given day, either at the pulpit or in the foyer, at the grocery store. It's, it's by his power alone that I stand. If it wasn't, I'd have given up long ago. So I pray, I have a prayer for us, that none of us would waste time on things that are untrue. I know, I know that you all have people in your lives, have things in your life that are trying to tell you that what you believe and what you pursue and what you value isn't worth it. I pray that we don't waste time believing something that's untrue. But rather, to pursue the knowledge of the truth, to pursue the things of Christ, to dwell on the things of Christ. Again, don't take my word for it. I don't want you guys to just hear a sincere recounting of my, my, my walk with Christ and just be like, that was emotional, that was powerful, that was, that was captivating. No, it's my story. You have your own. Know the truth. Pursue the truth. Ask good questions. Dwell on it. Let it encourage you. Let the truth of the gospel of Christ encourage us today. Be aware that Peter has warned us of false teachers, of mockers of of being lied to of being deceived and test what i say test what has already been taught to you test it against god's word and if it fails put it away put it away from you if it fails the test don't hesitate Dwell on the truth and let it encourage you. And finally, if, if the truth encourages you, share the truth with those around you. Because there's a lot more people in the world like 17-year-old Troy who lack hope in anything. Share the truth with them because the gospel is the only hope that we have Let's pray. Father God, I am so grateful to you, Lord, for the message that you have given to me of not this message, Lord, uh, not this singular one, Lord, but the gospel message, God, that as sinners separated from God for all eternity, you saw fit to change the situation, that you embodied the embodied the in the person of jesus christ you came down and you emptied yourself to demonstrate for us what a what a life lived in devotion to god was supposed to look like and then died for us god in a gruesome in a gruesome way god we thank you for the truth of who your son is that he didn't stay dead that he rose again giving ultimate kinds of hope, Lord, to the world, that there is a way to be reconciled to the Father through the person of Christ, through faith in him alone, by grace alone, by, by this free gift of, of, of yours. Lord, I pray that we would all hear that message, 
I pray that we would believe it, Lord. I pray that if we're skeptical, I pray that we ask the good questions that we need to know, Lord, to, to come to, to, to knowledge of you. I pray, Lord, that not one of us walks out of here. That not one of us walks out of here without testing, <laughs> testing what I've told them, testing what others have told them, Lord, but, but putting their trust solely in you by putting their trust solely in your word, Lord, which is trustworthy. I thank you for all of this, and ultimately, Lord, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your son Jesus, the ultimate gift to all of us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.